Uh, Happy New Year to everybody in YouTube land and it's the first today, the first of January, so I thought it would be a good idea to have a look round the blooms, which is actually something that's pretty difficult for me. As you know, I've got loads and loads of variegated plants, loads of interesting carnivorous plants, different leaves of different shapes, varieties, all the stuff that I love, but I know lots of people like just the flowers, so that's what we're going to look at today. Let's jump in. And we are in, and we will zoom over to my Caleri, because it's looking really nice at the moment. This is Caleria Sunshine. And I'll just take you or try and ignore some of the little bits of coal damage on the leaves there. It's not really supposed to bloom at this time of year, but it's doing its thing and I'm really pleased that it is. So that is my Caleria. I've had it bushier, I've had it more floriferous, but like I say, it is now January, January the 1st, and it really shouldn't be doing this. But I'm not keeping it in its natural habitat, obviously. But I'm really pleased that it's come back into bloom. And I've got a number of Caleria, which are all semi-dormant at the moment, not doing anything, not getting much water. And hopefully in a month, I will start to bring them back to life again. So that's the Caleria Sunshine. Gorgeous thing. If you don't have them, I think you should. Now moving on over to this beautiful little African violet here. I'm not really a big fan of African violets, but you know, anything that's in bloom, I'm quite happy with. African violet, what's this one? Optimal something or other. Can't get it out, it seems to be stuck. Optimara my joy. ST. Not sure what that means. Nice little African violet there. I don't really have many, and the ones that I did have seem to have died off. I've got a really nice variegated one down here, but oh, it's not a bloom. Back off, back off, Jeff. With a couple of begonias in flower, but begonias aren't really much to talk about in terms of blooms, but sometimes they can look quite pretty. This begonia black fang here has these very delicate, tiny little things. It's not something that I think will win any competitions, but when they do come out properly, I think they will enhance that beautiful plant. So that's it as far as blooms. Oh, tell a lie, there's one over here. If you can call it a bloom. It's a very delicate little thing. This is one of my Tredescantia. So this one is Zabrina Purple Joy. Um, pretty little thing on the end of a semi-cold damaged <laughs> leaf over there. So all the things in here look absolutely fantastic, I have to say at the moment, but they're not blooms. Do you want it blooms? So I'm gonna give you blooms. Let's head all over to the greenhouse and we'll have a look at what's going on over there. Okay, we're over in the greenhouse. So I've showed you this quite a number of days ago before Christmas in fact, and things have changed that much. I thought it was worth showing them again. So we have a couple of impatiens here. Now this one you can see already is looking, if you can remember anyway, is looking a lot better than it did when you saw it last. Now we did talk about the sulfur hot box, which has definitely rid it of mites for the time being. Lovely little blooms, these things. So this is Impatiens, I don't think I'm going to really give the proper name for this. Uh, Impatiens oricoma cross with bicordata. And it was looking very chlorotic. And obviously the mites have caused that. But you can see that it probably to your eye is looking greener now. Somebody suggested giving it some Epsom salts. Now I might have looked that up, Epsom salts. And I do actually have some. But when you look it up, Epsom salts actually improves the chlorophyll uh, manufacture or the making of the chlorophyll in the plant. And it does seem to have worked to some degree. Certainly the leaves are a lot more deep green. There's a lot less of the chloroticness that you can see on this one over here. This has had it too, but I still think this is improved because if I hold this one up, you can see all the beautiful blooms on there. This is another one of those so-called parrot plants or parrot blooms. I think there are a number that carry that uh, synonym. But both of them have definitely improved just by giving it or giving them some Epsom salts. I must say that I have up until now been a little bit, I suppose, laissez-faire in my attitude towards feeding and for most plants, it probably works okay if you just give them like a general purpose feed, but sometimes a little bit more targeted 
nutrition is needed and this is a case in point. So I was recently reading a book on, uh, it's like a botany book, I can't remember who wrote it. What I'll actually do, I'll stick it on screen or put something in the description. And this guy talked about nutrition in plants and nutrients in plants and he said think of it like a barrel like a beer barrel with staves up the side and if you could cut all those staves to different lengths and like leave the barrel intact and start filling it with water what would actually happen would be that the water would leak out of the lowest stave quite obvious but a really good analogy to think of how plants deal with nutrients. So for plants, it's certainly not a case of give them most of what they need and they will be fine. It's more of a case of if there is one nutrient that they are lacking in, that will stunt the plant's growth or that will have an effect, a detrimental effect. So you're always looking at the lowest stave in effect. So that seems to be what's happened here. The guy that mentioned the Epsom salts also mentioned giving them some nitrogen as well. Now, I'm not sure how to give them nitrogen other than a general purpose fertilizer which has some nitrogen in it. So I'm going to have to uh, do a little bit more digging on that and see if I've actually got anything that can increase the nitrogen levels and see if we can get these plants looking much better. They're already looking much better. If you did catch my last vlog, I'm sure you'll agree that they're looking way better than they did even then. Now they've not had the sulphur on them since. There's still one or two yellowing leaves, but I expect that. I think when they're at this kind of stage, I don't really think they're going to recover. I think it's a case of giving them something that will produce newer leaves which don't look like that, that don't look chlorotic and that's exactly what's happened on this one over here. You can see the newer leaves are much deeper green. I didn't mention what this one was called. This one is Niam Niamensis. There you go, Empatians Niam Niamensis, parrot plant. Another parrot plant. Okay, so a couple of blooms over there. Let's have a look what else is going on. Not really worth mentioning those two. These are all my Streptocarpus that I have dealt with. I've got so many Streptocarpus. I'm not actually doing them all at once. I'm not dealing with them all at once. I just keep coming in, doing a few, and leaving it, coming back, doing a few more and leaving it. So it's all about blooms, isn't it? Shut up, get on with it. So Dendrobium, Cuthbertsonii hybrid. One single bloom on that one. Uh, this is, oh gosh, Subwest CNC crossed with Cuthbertsonii. I did lose a lot of these, but there was, it was definitely the mites that caused it because as soon as I got the sulfur hotbox going, this recovered. So I may well get some more of these and stop worrying about why they all died off. And we'll just move up here. So this one is, as lots of you will know, the gorgeous, incomparable in my eyes, Mastervalia ignea. And it looks absolutely superb. These blooms are just something else. And no matter how many times I see them, I never really get used to them. And I don't really think, much as I like other Mastervalias, I don't really think there's one that's as nice as this. Very subjective, I know. But just check that out, that is just gorgeous. I don't think I'm gonna take this to the orchid show just simply because it isn't a particularly fabulous specimen. I can't seem to get the media right for this. I always get it to bloom, but it's always a little sporadic and it doesn't really throw up the number of blooms that it should. I find that the media that I've got it in, it seems to want to climb away from that. It just doesn't seem to want to put the roots down. I can't even remember what it's in. Before you start sticking suggestions in the comments, I really don't know what it's in. I think I've had it in moss in the past. I think it's probably a bit of a mix now. Maybe peat, moss and perlite rings a bell. I'll have to have a look. Whatever it's in, it just, I don't know, don't think it's that happy in there. Um, just from the, the way that the roots are going. They don't seem to be penetrating. Of course, I'll have to have a look, proper look and look down inside. I'm really going off the fact that it seems to be wanting to climb out and away from the pot and it's not thrown up that many blooms. I think that's really what's making me think it's not that happy in that media. But we'll have a close look at that at some other point. A little pinguicula here, Guatemala this one. You can see gorgeous thing but another one coming there what it does it kills these off around the side when it's cooler or the temperatures are cooler 
Uh, they can go to like a winter version of it with very, very tight leaves. Mine doesn't seem to do that, probably because I keep the temperatures around about 12 in here now. I did have them going down to seven at one point and then I caved in and <laughs> raised them back up to 12. I couldn't help myself. I just hated to see things dying off. Uh, but you do get these, these leaves dying off and they're very easy to pull away and bin off and then we'll have the new set coming up. Just a few streptocarpus left now in bloom and to be honest, I really want them to be over. Uh, I will probably, if I can bring myself to do it, chop the rest off very soon. Certainly uh, a week from now, I'll start to do that. Um, they've gone a lot longer than I anticipated, but I want them to come back early and they need a rest. They really do need a rest. After blooming all year round, uh, that's something that they are going to benefit from if I give them at least a couple of months where they're not in full growth and they're not blooming. But they are blooms and I'm showing you blooms. So let's move over to more of the bloomy section if we're going to talk about blooms. Uh, here's one that I might stick in the orchid show. Again, it's not a particularly fantastic specimen, but it's nice just to put something in there. So this is the species Oncidium sotoanum. It looks like it's already got a dead bloom there, but that's not a disaster. We've got two spikes there, one which is about to come, and there's another spike there which is kind of semi-come. I'm really pleased with this because this is one that almost died off with the invisible mites that it had. And you can just about see that all it is doing there is resting on some moss. I found that a really useful way of recovering orchids in my environment. Rather than completely burying them in moss, I simply rest them on top. I found that using bark just doesn't work in my environment for whatever reason. It's odd because Ed from Ed's Orchids says the exact opposite. Um, but his environment might not be the same as mine. Yes, he's roughly this, well, he's the same latitude. He is the same latitude. He's a little bit more north, northerly than I am, but not very much, you know, 50 miles north to what I am. And it can be simple as the fact that I'm in shade and he isn't. You know, I'm in full shade. He might be south facing, completely clear view to the sun. Not that it's that sunny that often, but it can make a difference. So that's basically just sitting on top of moss. And I find that's much easier in the cooler temperatures of winter and the dull weather and the short days to control the moisture in the moss. I can allow it to dry out and I can see it really easily. And in fact, the roots have penetrated down into the moss. So I'm really pleased with that for that reason. So it is a rescue in terms of the roots because it had zero roots and now it has. So then we come to the cyclum and this is that one that's a little bit strange in that for once the leaves seem to be higher up than the blooms. I guess this is something to do with me spraying them very early on and there is the uh, the, the little bit of proof that it was sprayed, you can see that one there that I've got it between my fingers is completely malformed and mutated and that is what systemic insecticides will do to cyclamen. It's, it's okay, it'll recover, it will bloom again next year and I'm not going to use systemics on them ever again because I now have the hot box. So we have the same thing going on with this bigger one. Bigger specimen there should be much more reflexed even though it's very nice. That one's better, that's a more natural as to what it should look like even though you've got one there that's not totally reflexed. These are what it shouldn't look like. I may well cut those off. There's lots more coming down here and you can see the ones which are looking the way they should and the ones that are not looking the way they should. So they need coming off and then I'm more likely to get the, uh, the more natural blooms. Over here we have a couple that I bought fairly recently, a couple of months ago, and these don't appear to have any kind of tuber down there. I'm desperate to get in and have a closer look but I'm not going to do it until the blooms are over. I don't want to spoil them. Uh, that one is scented. Moving on over, these are looking much, much nicer. I know you've seen them, but these are way more floriferous than they were the last time you saw them. Absolutely gorgeous thing, especially close up. I think last time you saw it, there was only one of these red ones and purple ones in bloom. And now we've got lots and lots in bloom. Looking gorgeous. And look how many blooms there are to come. Absolutely brilliant value just for a few pounds. Lovely thing. I absolutely adore them. I wish I had a few more. I say that for all my plants. That one looks particularly nice next to this Cymbidium. 
I only have the one Cymbidium. Again, I wish I had more. They're very, very big to fit in the greenhouse with all the other plants. And I've seen lots of people that specialize in them. And wow, what a show they put on when they do come. You can see from this one, it's not a great specimen. It's not that healthy. Again, another one that had spider mites. And if you look, I'll just stand up. If you look closely at the back there, it's desperate need of a repot, lots of dead stuff around the back. Um, but we've got some green leaves. It's coming again now that it's mite free. You can see these are totally opening up properly, but they're okay. I'm still quite happy with that. Great big long name on that one. I'll just show it you just in case you don't know what it is. Cymbidium erythrostylus. Stylus. Not sure that's correct. Cross with Dianum variety Simoncianum. Gosh, what a name. Don't know who come up with that one. So we have a very sorry looking Pelagonium in bloom still. This one is very, very hurry and it really doesn't like these temperatures, but it still keeps throwing out new blooms. And over here we have another Pelagonium, uh, that one, I think St. Elmo's Fire, just hanging on there in the depths of winter. I don't think that one will come back. And looking up here, a species Pelagonium, there you go, a little tiny thing. Didn't expect that to come back into bloom. I did chop the species ones back because that is a good thing to do with the species ones in winter. Not much left on the Neostaris Lucineri. It did have about six bloom spikes, just a single one left now, chop the rest of them off, and that's nearly ready for having another year's rest. Now there are loads of blooms to come. So this Pleurothalis over here, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five spikes that I can see here, probably oh no, two more at the back there, six, seven spikes. So that's gonna be much better than it's been in the past. I've not had anything on the Berioda because of mite for a few years, but we've got one bloom spike there. I'm hoping we get some more. I don't know whether it's actually come back enough for that yet, but at least it's on the right path, isn't it? And in terms of New Year's resolutions, I really need to start focusing more on orchids again. I really feel that I lost so many orchids and it's such a shame. And mainly it was the mites and I didn't know I had them. So I hoping that the rest of the culture was okay and I can improve on my orchid growing again and get us going on that again. Some beautiful, beautiful Nepenthes here. It's not a bloom I know, but gosh, I can't really miss a chance to look at that. I think that's as beautiful as any bloom. And just look at the nectar and the dew or whatever you want to call it. I suppose it's more nectar, isn't it? The exudate underneath the lid there, just ready for some unsuspecting insect to come along and lick and then fall into the deadly trap. Nothing at all. There's a couple of little tiny ones in there. Can you see them? A couple of little tiny flies. That will not be all that's giving nutrition to these plants at the moment because I am spraying them with dilute orchid feed and you can see it does actually work. If you look over at these, we've got new pictures coming all over the place and all I'm doing is spraying them sometimes inside, sometimes on the leaves, sometimes both with dilute orchid feed. And it definitely, in my case anyway, does seem to work. The problem with that kind of thing is you don't know what would have happened if you didn't spray them. But you know, I'm sticking with it, it works. And it's easy for me as well because I have it all there in the pot already in the pump action sprayer, ready to spray other plants. So why not just spray my Nepenthes at the same time? And it does seem to work for me. So not a great deal in blue, but a few things to look at and a few things to discuss. So coming up in the future, hopefully loads of new content. As always, put your suggestions in the comments. I'm always willing to research something or to answer some question or to look into something that people are interested in. I don't want to put myself forward as an expert because I'm clearly not an expert. I'm making as many mistakes as everybody else, but I'm willing to put the groundwork in and try and find out what causes these things, what causes the problems that we all have and trying to come up with some solutions or some suggestions or trying it myself and see if it works for me and then putting the information out there for you to have a look at and make your own decisions. That's really the basis of the channel and what I'm hoping to achieve and to move forward in and continue to do in 2023. So if you're interested in that, subscribe, give me a thumbs up, write something in the comments and for now I'll see you on the next one. Bye!